Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. I'm really excited about today. I think this is a great finale for our fall quarter. Uh, today we have with us two of the main uh, drivers of Form Energy, which has come up in several previous uh, seminars this quarter from the regulators to the competitors to the complementers. So I'm really excited about this. We have here with us uh, Eddie Baldwin, uh, who is a Harvard undergrad in chemistry and physics, but also an EIPER joint MBA program alumni from Stanford, who's been with Forum since 2019, I believe. 2020. 2020, I think your bio is no, sorry. Uh, and then on, uh, on video from Somerville, Mass, working hard uh, at headquarters, we have Scott Berger, uh, who is a uh, undergrad uh, from uh, Wash U, uh, but also has a master's degree and a PhD in uh, engineering systems from MIT, where we've actually had several previous uh, seminar speakers. I won't go into all that, and they are doing this exciting work at Forum Energy, one of the hardest, hottest uh, clean tech startups uh, around town. So Annie, take it away. Thank you. Uh, it, it is a it's a real honor to be here. I um, as as you mentioned, I went to Stanford. I just graduated about two years ago, and I went to a lot of these energy seminars. So it's it's really special to to be here and be with all, you all today. Um, we will just do a brief round of intros. So uh, I lead battery product management here at Form, which basically means that I kind of work closely with folks like Scott and everyone else on our commercial analytics team on really understanding what the value and opportunity is for multi-day storage, how utilities think about it, what is it that they really need, and then with our technology teams, making sure that we're actually building the right battery that unlocks that value. So I kind of work at the intersection of both of those worlds. And I will let Scott introduce himself. Uh, Recording in progress. Well, <laughs> so uh, it's great to be here. Um, I don't think that MIT has invited us to do one of these talks. So I think Stanford is kind of uh, <laughs> you know, taking the lead right now. So no, it, it is really great to be here. Um, appreciate it. I, I have a whole shtick about what analytics is at Form Energy later, so I won't dig into it too much. Um, but you know, we're really closely with great people like Annie to uh, understand the value of our products. Great. Well, we'd love just to share with you guys a little bit about Form, what we're up to here, how we see the market opportunity. And as Scott mentioned, he'll kind of share a little bit more on the analytics side, how we go about modeling future grids. Um, so for those of you who don't know about Form, uh, we are a company building a new class of storage assets, which we call multi-day storage. Uh, we've been at it since about 2017. Uh, now we're about 170 folks, and we're based out of both Somerville, that's where we do a lot of the cell development and R&D and engineering, and then we also have a big team out of Berkeley, that's where I work out of, where we do the product and systems development as well. We also have a, a manufacturing facility out in Pittsburgh, so that's where we are today. I expect if we come back here in a year, we will have grown substantially uh, since then. Um, so we, d we just announced this year we raised our Series D, so now we've raised it just close to uh, $400 million from folks who really understand kind of what it takes to build a totally new class of storage asset um, and really have this kind of long-term view about how to invest and how to build um, new reliable assets for the grid. And just for some fun for some fun folks, so that, that photo up there at the top, uh, that's from our 30-day in asset. That's where we were kind of jumping, where we got to be together after, uh, after being apart for, from pan the pandemic. Uh, and then up here in the upper right is one of our full-scale cells. So I'll kind of talk to you guys a little bit about what actually is in a cell and what it does. Um, but th there's just kind of a little bit of a flavor of being both kind of building a new storage asset that really builds a new grid, but also kind of building new chemistry that, that enables that. So when we think kind of broadly about why Form started and what is the problem space that we're really trying to solve, um, simply it's how do we replace the, the opportunity of what fossil fuel plants do today? And that, even in the U.S. alone, it's close to a terawatt of opportunity. Uh, so this particular uh, figure on the left shows what we're projecting out, looking out through 2050, of what future grids really look like. And you'll see that there's a huge expected uh, growth in renewables, at least a forex growth between now and 2050. Uh, huge growth also of capacity as well, um, meeting kind of the electrification demand. Uh, but there's still a lot of existing uh, kind of legacy fossil fuel assets that, that kind of remain on the grid. And this is kind of our problem space of how do, what does it really take for us to really retire that, both for coal and then natural gas. 
And if you think about why is it that we still expect to have some coal and natural gas on the grid, uh, it's really a, a reliability problem. So you guys might have talked about this in your energy seminar, but you might hear utilities a lot talking about how do I build a affordable, clean, and reliable grid. So when you think about it, re reliability, it's really making sure that you're delivering electricity 365 days um, a year, but also across all these different types of weather events that could happen on the grid. Um, so we're just showing you a sample of how utilities really think about this and some of the reliability challenges that they see. Uh, so one, and this is on the upper left-hand side, for the Pacific Northwest, maybe it's very hydro-loaded, and maybe you'll have these multi-day events where you have low hydro generation and you need a new kind of low-cost energy to, to ride through those multi-day events. Um, some of you may, be, may have been familiar with the polar vortex that happened earlier this year where you have kind of the confluence of bad factors happening where you'll have low wind generation, you'll have gas, gas assets are not operating, and then you'll just have a big problem where you just cannot meet energy demand or you'll have very, very high electricity prices. So utilities even today are really thinking about how do we solve these types of problems, which today mostly gas solves today, but we want to do this in a, in a firm, clean, reliable way in the future. Um, so if you think about the design space, and this is actually one of my favorite stories about Forum, is we, didn't, we weren't so much pick a technology and then find a problem that we wanted to solve, but we did it the other way around, which is if you want to solve that reliability challenge, what is the best way or what are the types of uh, kind of requirements on a storage basis that really solve that reliability space? So we, and, and Scott will speak uh, to this in much more detail, but when you model out what future grids look like with high renewable penetration, you want a new class of storage asset that's at least 10 times longer in duration and at least a tenth the cost, installed cost of lithium ion to really replace the generation of what we see for, for fossil fuel assets today. So on the um, y-axis, you'll see this is kind of an installed cost. Expect, you know, lithium ion today installed cost, so that's all in, not just the hardware cost, but, you know, turnkey, everything installed cost to utility is around 300 bucks a kilowatt hour, probably bottoms out at um, 100 bucks a kilowatt hour on like a fundamental basis. But if you want to build a new kind of fundamental different type of storage asset that lasts for multiple days, so lasts for 100 hours, it has to be very, very low cost. So more on the order of about $10 a kilowatt hour. So this is kind of the design space for form is has to last for about 100 hours, has to be on the order of 10 to 30 bucks a kilowatt hour. And this is really kind of the opportunity space that we're solving within. So when Form started, we uh, kind of looked all across the possible design space. So what is it that, um, what are the different types of electrochemical couples that you could look at that could really get you to that very low cost? And if you look at a graph like this, there's, you know, many existing technologies today. Like I mentioned, if you were to do lithium ion on a, just on a chemical cost basis, a dollar per kilowatt hour, you're around 60 bucks a kilowatt hour. But iron air has actually been around uh, for quite a while, since like the 1970s. This technology has really been around and has the fundamentals about being a very, very cheap technology that can get you to very low cost. Um, what's different about Forum, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, is we can access a form of iron that's very different and kind of readily accessible from the steel supply chain today, which allows us to really get to very, very low costs um, on the order of a dollar per kilowatt hour. So when you think about what does an iron air battery do, how does it work, um, you can think about it as a reversible rust or an air breathing battery. So on discharge, the battery breathes in air, so you take your oxygen from the air, one of, our, the, uh, one of the cathodes or the catalyst in the cathode will react with the oxygen to form hydroxide ions, and then you'll convert that iron to iron oxide. And then on charge, you're going to reverse that process. So the battery will kind of breathe out oxygen, you'll return iron back to its metallic form, and then you'll breathe out oxygen. And that, rep that process repeats for thousands and thousands of cycles. So this is uh, kind of the fundamentals of if you were to pick a very durable, low-cost, scalable solution, uh, Iron Air actually fits a lot of those boxes when you want to kind of check how would I actually want to do this really well. So I spoke to this a little bit, but on an installed cost basis, we can really get to an installed cost about a tenth that of lithium ion. Uh, safety is a big factor, right? So not only is iron kind of one of the most globally available safe uh, molecules in the world, uh, but actually on the com components basis, which I'll talk to about in a little bit, um, it's really just iron, air, and then water is kind of the fundamentals of our chemistry. Uh, there's no risk of thermal runaway, um, and there's no heavy metals in the system. So it's a very safe system, which is something that, you, that really matters a lot for utilities. Uh, scale is, is also very important, right? You want to make sure that we can build this not just in the U.S., not just on in individual continents, but can you access a format of iron 
uh, all around the world, and you can't. Iron's actually made on every continent, right? So on a kind of a fundamentals basis, uh, this really gives us to very, very low cost entitlement that can actually meet the requirements, not just within the US, but kind of within the global, within the world. So on the fundamental building blocks of our system, so that you can think of the cell as kind of that, that fundamental chemical component, it really has all of those qualities that you want in terms of low cost, right? So the iron anode, this is a highly abundant, very low cost uh, metal that's readily available from the steel supply chain today with basically minimal changes that we can get to to in, uh, inform the format of our system. Our air electrodes, these are all kind of commercially proven, readily available electrodes. So there's nothing really new or fundamentally different there. And then the, they're all surrounded in kind of a basic electrolyte, a high pH system that's similar to what you get in, in AA batteries today. Uh, so that's kind of the, the core uh, building block on the chemistry side. And then on the balance of system side, which is our, all the auxiliary systems that you need to make the battery work, so air handling, water management, et cetera, all of these are kind of commercially off the shelf, readily available components. So there's nothing really new or fundamentally different that we're innovating on there. And that allows us to get to a very, very low overall installed cost. Um, so when you think about what this actually looks like in the field, eventually you can imagine a system that's you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres. Um, and it really starts with that core chemical building block, so this cell. So that cell is that our smallest repeatable electrochemical unit that includes the anode uh, cathodes, all surrounded in that water-based electrolyte. And then we build many of those cells in series and in parallel to build this battery module, which is kind of this DC power building block on the, about the kilowatt sale. If you'd imagine what this would look like in a room, it's about a one by one by one meter module. So a little bit about to my shoulder height. Um, and we really thought, we were very careful about kind of thinking about this design in a way that could really be low cost and easily installed and easily managed in the field. So something that could easily be shipped to a project site, e easily movable with a forklift. Um, and then you, to get an actual power block, which is what a utility would really need, they want something that's fully connected to the grid at the medium or high voltage uh, system. You want not just many of those power modules, you'd actually have maybe thousands of those modules all surrounding around a utility grade inverter on the order of a megawatt scale. And then to get to the um, many hundreds of megawatt or even gigawatt scale, which is what you would really want to be kind of similar to what you get for gas plants today, you can imagine a 100 megawatt system would be about a 10 gigawatt hour um, installed battery, right? So it's a lot of capacity that you would get. And this is what we really think is the opportunity in space of how you could really replace uh, gas and coal plants. So just to give you guys a picture of what this looks like, you might appreciate this from being in an academic environment all the way up to product space. So in, uh, just in early 2018, this really just started with an iron anode, right? Just one small pellet and just proving out that that could really work. Uh, and then we've scaled up since then, both to kind of at the subscale, the subscale cell level, building out to that full, uh, full height cell. So that kind of gets to my shoulder height that gets you to that one um, meter depth. Uh, and then we've scaled out since then, both on width and then also uh, on the module basis as well. So kind of building out what that first uh, proof point looks like in terms of what an actual embodied electrochemical system looks like. So it's a, it's a big scale. If you were to actually imagine this on a order of magnitude basis, uh, you know, the, on a power basis from the iron anode to a full module, that's, I think it's 300,000 X. Uh, it's quite big that we've been able to do in the last few years, which is really exciting. Uh, so we have a first uh, pilot project, which is really exciting uh, when you think about the opportunity and demand. So we're working with Great River Energy. They are a small uh, co-op in uh, Cambridge, Minnesota, and we will be deploying a one and a half megawatt, 100 megawatt hour system that will be coming online in 2023. And I think one thing that's particularly exciting about this is it's easy to think of multi-day or long duration storage as kind of a far out problem or a solution that you wouldn't really want now. But in this particular utility, there's a lot of drivers that really drove them to be very excited about form, even kind of starting from two years ago. They have a coal plant in their area that's retiring, and they have a lot of wind assets, and they're just really craving a new form of firm, clean capacity that they can use to replace what, uh, what that coal plant used to provide. And that's where they got really excited by form, and where we're excited to bring this onto the grid uh, in the next two years. So with that, I will uh, transition it over to Scott and talk a little bit more about the, the modeling side. Thank you, Annie. Um, well, it was a great tee up for the company. I think uh, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, just, a, just a bit about you know, what analytics does at Form Energy. I, I think Annie touched on this early, but we, we really try to be a 
uh, I mean, just across the board, you know, obviously a quantitatively driven company, we want to make all of our decisions, you know, informed by, um, you know, the best possible analysis, and, you know, that includes at the very technical level. So we have, um, you know, I have a, the next slide talks about this, but we, you know, we have a lot of folks that do it, things that could be considered analytics at form, um, really, you know, with the analytics team within the broader business development and analytics group at form does, uh, is kind of, uh, quantitative modeling of markets. So anything that touches the, you know, kind of economic or project or system value of our asset. Um, and that is, you know, that, that requires a, um, you know, essentially beyond a, an Excel model to analyze. That is what um, the analytics team focuses on. So, you know, largely we're really kind of driven by the desire to uh, understand the, the future trends of the power sector and how that will um, you know, impact the, ac the economics of different assets, including our own. So we want to be very unbiased, uh, but then obviously we want to inform, you know, forms kind of product and strategy and policy decisions based on that. Um, so we, we do this kind of unbiased or what we think of as unbiased um, assessment of market fundamentals and, and system economics, and then use that to help form build projects. So we, you know, we work really closely with our commercial operations team, um, to really educate our customers. Uh, the reality is most, most utilities have not seen a 100 hour battery before. Um, some are, you know, still think that four hour lithium ion batteries are nascent technology. So this is a hundred hour battery. Sounds very strange to them. So we do a lot of customer education and, and help them, you know, understand what the business case could be. Um, we then, we also realize that, you know, this is not, uh, you know, form is playing, uh, really a 30 year game. Um, you know, this is not a kind of a, an effort to, um, you know, get into a market and, and get out quickly. This is, you know, we, we see this as a, a multi-decade effort. Uh, you know, we're all motivated by the desire to decarbonize. And so what we, what we are trying to do is, is, you know, educate the market on what we think are the right uh, mechanisms to decarbonize cost effectively. Um, and then we obviously want to do that by providing our unique view. So when, you know, when we think about things from the multi-day energy storage perspective, that's the kind of unique perspective that we can bring. Um, and then obviously we, we partner with internal teams to help them uh, do their thing. So, you know, either informing the policy and regulatory affairs team or, uh, you know, the product uh, management team that, that uh, any runs um, as well as, you know, any other kind of teams internally, including the tech team, you know, we work with them to provide uh, assessments of, of how our batteries should be expected to operate and, and things like that. Um, this, this goes back, you know, really to the very, founding days of Form, uh, Form's, you know, one of Form's five co-founders was uh, Marco Ferrara, who led business development and analytics, analytics being one of the core teams from the very beginning. And, you know, Form's actually, the first kind of experience using analytics at Form was uh, the, the company was actually founded around the idea of maybe building a 1000 hour battery. And then we went and, you know, we looked at the different, as Annie mentioned, the different chemistries that could maybe deliver on what we thought was necessary or, or we thought was going to be important and said, okay, how would these things actually work out economically in the market? And uh, then, you know, kind of moved that goal down to actually let's, let's focus on uh, maybe 175 or 200 hours. And that was all informed by project level uh, economic modeling. And then actually when, when Annie joined, she kind of uh, led another effort that we worked on together to um, say, actually, what do we think is the, the right thing that clears in the market and then uh, ended up going to hundred hours. So it's, it, I guess all of that is to say that one, this has started from very early on in the company's history, and two, it's had real impact on you know how we think about the product that we're building and the thing that we're trying to go do. Um, Annie, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, th this is maybe just a, a, a another rephrasing of what I just said. But long story short, at Form Energy Analytics is really, uh, or at least the, the analytics team, uh, is anything that touches energy markets or project economics and that is too big to excel. Um, so, you know, primarily we're using Python based power system models, um, you know, we're, we're leveraging, you know, cloud infrastructure to, to run those models, uh, because, uh, you know, a key, um, I guess, differentiating feature for what we're trying to do is, you know, model things in a scalable fashion and, and really represent the system with a lot of granularity, both, uh, in terms of how the system is operating from, you know, moment to moment in time, but also, uh, you know, with, with respect to space. So we want to be representing the, um, you know, kind of the details of the grid. Uh, with the the maximum level possible, uh, and we're doing that, you know, informed by both you know existing system data, you know, historical data, and kind of forward looking data. If you want to go to the next slide, Annie. 
Um, part of, you know, a big part of what motivates our work at Form is a desire to understand the value of our product and, and just kind of how the system is, the power system will evolve in general. Um, and the, a major driver of what we do is, is a belief that, you know, the best way to understand, um, you know, system economics is with uh, optimization-based, you know, production cost and capacity expansion models or capacity expansion unit, unit commitment and economic dispatch models. Um, we, we confront this very often, either utilities or, you know, IPPs or policymakers trying to assess, you know, the relative value of different technologies using first, you know, a levelized cost of storage metric. Uh, we think that this is a pretty, you know, flawed way to do things in part because one it is only an assessment of cost and it does not assess value. Uh, and even its assessment of cost is actually very imperfect because you have to make an assumption about what is the, you know, what is the, the cost of the energy that you are charging the battery with. Um, and, and more often than not, in almost every case that we've seen uh, in LCOS or levelized cost of storage model, you know, they assume some flat value. So you're paying, I don't know, $20 per megawatt hour to charge energy. Um, but of course, you know, in, in the uh, real power systems, the, the, char or the, the cost of energy varies over time and, you know, really depends. Are you charging from energy that uh, would either be curtailed or, you know, go into the battery or are you co-located with a wind farm that, you know, has some kind of uh, um, negative correlation with pricing? So, you know, when the wind is blowing very strongly, uh, energy prices tend to be lower. And so maybe you're charging with energy that is, you know, less than average price, et cetera. So, uh, really LCOS, it only assesses cost and even that it does a pretty bad job at. Um, so we really don't like, we don't like that kind of modeling. Um, the next thing that we, that we tend to see when people are, are maybe being a little bit more sophisticated than, um, than, uh, you know, traditional, uh, LCOS modeling is some kind of, you know, price taker dispatch modeling. So you'll say, okay, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to take some prices that I see in the market usually historical prices, although sometimes, uh, you know, forward-looking prices that uh, you get from some kind of vendor or some kind of futures market. Um, and you say, what, what is the economics or what is the, the kind of value of dispatching this battery against those prices? Uh, this does a little bit better job of, of capturing costs because you're, you're maybe capturing more realistic or a more realistic view of when the system is charging or discharging. Um, and at least it begins to capture value um, so it begins to capture kind of what is the system um, going to, uh, you know, produce in terms of, you know, returns and things like that. How is it going to benefit the system? Um, you know, it, it does that by representing different market products that are in, in the market. So maybe you're dispatching uh, against, you know, you're providing energy arbitrage. So you're dispatching against energy signals. Maybe you're providing some ancillary services, meaning, uh, you know, very quick changes in the state of charge of the battery in order to kind of balance the grid over time. Um, maybe you're, uh, maybe you're providing capacity. So you're, you're kind of reserving some amount of energy in the tank in order to be available, uh, during periods of, of grid stress. Uh, so you, you have some representation of market products. Uh, I have this kind of not filled in all the way because, um, in, in practice, uh, you know, the, you're not really capturing kind of the dynamics of those systems. So in, in reality, you know, if I choose to charge or discharge in an hour, that can actually impact uh, that can actually impact the value of that service. And uh, you, you tend not to get that in these price taker models. So it's maybe not perfect. Um, you're definitely not capturing how these assets are interacting with each other. Uh, meaning if I'm discharging now, is that preventing some other asset to, uh, from discharging, et cetera? Um, you know, you're, you're, maybe you're capturing a little bit about how the, the asset mix and the grid is changing. Um, and maybe a little bit about how that's changing associated with uh, you know, policy and regulatory constraints. But at the end of the day, that's kind of relying on an assumption that's happening outside the model, meaning you, you need to kind of assume that, um, that these, th these changes are happening in the grid and, and um, that uh, as a result, the, the, uh, the prices that you see in your model um, reflect those changes, but you know, ultimately it's imperfect. Um, and and you know, they're, they're really not capturing, they're not great at capturing any kind of uh, transmission detail or anything like that. Um, that brings us to you know production cost and capacity expansion models. These are the tools that we we tend to rely on most heavily because they capture you know the combination of these two things 
really captures everything uh, that we think is uh, really critical to, to understand the value of long duration storage. So, you know, together they can capture what market products are actually being offered in the system. They, they capture how this, this technology can interact with other technologies, meaning if I install this technology, does it you know, avoid the need for other technologies, maybe avoiding the need for transmission or avoiding the need for other more expensive forms of generation. Um, it obviously can capture the impact of you know, policy and regulatory constraints. So we want to decarbonize over time. Um, so we look forward and we say, okay, what's the, what's the best resource mix to do that? Um, you know, to a degree, we can capture uncertainty and things like that. So uh, this is a very long-winded way of saying, at the end of the day, what we think is really critical to understand the economics of these systems is, you know, very detailed kind of optimization-based modeling, and that informs a lot of our, our strategy and um, both around, you know, the product design, but also our, our market interactions and our business development. Um, so th this is the approach that we take. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Annie. Um, the, the tool, I'm, I'm going to talk about, you know, one tool that we tend to use, it's a tool called Formware. Uh, which is essentially a least cost um, capacity expansion model. And what capacity expansion means in the, in the power system context is essentially, you know, it's telling you what resources you should build and how you should operate those resources in order to meet uh, whatever objectives you have within, you know, realistic constraints. And so when I say whatever objectives I have, I mean, if I'm a utility, I'm making some forecast of my demand out into the future. And I'm saying I want to meet you know, some fraction of that demand uh, with clean energy or maybe specifically renewables. Um, and, you know, maybe there are some other constraints on my system. You know, I have transmission representation, things like that. Uh, and I need to be balancing supply and demand. Uh, maybe I can buy energy from a market or sell energy to a market. Uh, you know, you can kind of capture all of these things and then say, you know, based on all of those constraints, what is the, the best set of resources for me to go um, invest in and how should I operate those resources. That is what we, we do with Formware. And that, that's a tool that we've built up in-house over the last um, you know, four and a half years. Uh, and, and we use it, like I said, to inform all of these different decisions. Uh, I'm going to highlight a couple of projects or a couple of kind of outcomes that we've seen uh, and, and just talk about you know, how we tend, you know, essentially show some examples of how we use Formware to inform some of the decisions that we make. Any, if you want to go to the next slide. Oh, uh, well. Uh, this is, so I actually forgot about the slide, but uh, <laughs> long story short, this is just a reiteration of kind of all of the different ways that we use um, analytics at form, uh, or really kind of market analytics at form, uh, everything from kind of business development, kind of commercial support, all the way through, uh, you know, supporting our policy teams and, and our product management teams. Um, so this is, this is one of the, the kind of case studies that I wanted to highlight and just um, I think it, it's useful because it underscores uh, it underscores really the the value piece that I was trying to describe earlier. Meaning, you know, how using these capacity expansion models to understand the value that NASA can provide in the system. Um, this is a case study that we built uh, for kind of a least cost um, representation, or essentially a representation of uh, MISO, which is I, I don't know the the power systems background of this group. So I'll explain it briefly. Uh, but MISO is, stands for the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. Uh, it, is the, it is an entity that kind of spans uh, much of the middle of the US that operates the US power grid in that region, uh, meaning it, it uh, essentially you know, tells power plants when to turn on and turn off in order to meet demand uh, at every different location in the system. Um, and, and MISO, as, a, as an independent system operator, it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't really um, tell, you know, tell the grid which resources to go buy or which resources to go uh, invest in, but it does do some kind of forward-looking planning uh, because the system operator, in order to maintain reliability, you know, it's tasked with maintaining reliability. It needs to kind of know what, what assets it should expect um, to be online at any given point in time. Um, a lot of the utilities within, within the Midwest are thinking about decarbonizing and uh, you know, this case study was really a lot more relevant when um, the clean energy performance plan was being considered uh, as part of the reconciliation package with, within the Biden administration. But uh, so, so within that time, they, the uh, one of the potential outcomes of the CEPP was that, uh, you know, all of the states and utilities within MISO would have been uh, incentivized to, to move towards 80% clean energy 
uh, by 2030 on a path to 100% by 2035. Um, that, that policy no longer exists, but the case study is still relevant uh, because it, it kind of, again, points us to how, how can long duration storage or multi-day storage provide value in a decarbonizing power system. Uh, and the long story short, uh, essentially, the way we think about value is you say, okay, what's, what's the least cost pathway to providing um, you know, 80% decarbonization in MISO without multi-day storage? And that's kind of the middle bar. Um, and then what's the least cost portfolio providing, uh, multi or providing 80% decarbonization with multi-day storage? And what we tend to see is you know, without multi-day storage, we build a lot of renewables. Actually, we do that in really either case. Um, we, we actually in, end up building a really substantial amount of lithium ion, and then we end up building a little bit of uh, natural gas combined cycle plants with carbon capture and sequestration. That should, uh, should say CCS, not natural gas CC. Um, so we end up building you know, quite a few, uh, you know, quite a bit of renewables, and then uh, overbuilding or building a substantially larger amount of lithium ion, as well as some uh, uh, carbon capture and sequestration systems to provide um, firm capacity. With multi-day storage, we end up uh, building a little bit less renewables. We, we end up with a, a very similar quantity of storage, but uh, we, we have to rely a little bit less on wind. Um, and the impact there that's not shown on this slide is that's largely due to an uh, you know, increasing utilization of those assets. So we really reduce curtailment on that system um, and, and end up uh, you know, with, with essentially about a 40% reduction in curtailment. Uh, we replace a, a substantial amount of the lithium ion. It's, it's not a perfect substitute because these really are different assets um, and, and that provide different services. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but we, we, we replace a substantial amount of that and then obviate the need for kind of more expensive forms of firm capacity like um, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, so, you know, what this shows is not only uh, essentially how, you know, how the system changes with uh, the ability to invest in these kind of assets, but also where the value emerges from. It emerges from kind of improving that utilization um, and, and changing the asset mix in a way that reduces overall asset needs. You wanna go to the next slide, Danny? Um, this is kind of an, another cut at that same story in a different uh, region. This is for a utility in the Western United States, which is uh, WEC stands for, you know, some, essentially the, the entity responsible for maintaining reliability in the Western US. Um, and you know, I think without going into too much detail on, on this slide, because it's really not necessary, I, I, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you can really use this, uh, this kind of framework to understand both the system level uh, value as well as the, the asset level value and saying for a particular project in a particular system, what is the total value that we provide in a, you know, in a decarbonizing portfolio? Um, and if you want to go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that I mentioned that kind of comes out of this style of modeling is not only, you know, which assets should we invest in, but how should those assets operate? Uh, what this shows is the operational profile of a multi-day storage system um, represented by the state of energy or state of charge, uh, essentially. So, you know, 100% state of charge or state of energy is the battery is completely full, 0% is completely empty. Um, and what this shows is you know, the, the profile, and I have, um, on the next slide, I have a, a direct comparison, but the profile of how a, a multi-day storage system would operate, and it's very different um, than lithium ion or other types of, of resources. Uh, what we tend to see is some combination of intraday battery cycling. So that's represented by these kind of uh, purple bars on the right, where you see essentially, you know, um, some charging and some discharging within a single day period. Um, you know, maybe eight to 12 hour bursts uh, over, you know, a period of, of maybe high demand or, or low renewable energy production. Um, moving to the left, we tend to see also, so we see, we see that kind of intraday behavior overlaid with some kind of seasonal behavior. So in this case, we're kind of charging up the battery or kind of net charging the battery over a, about a one month period in the spring where we tend to have, you know, high renewable generation and low demand, followed by um, you know, a multi-month uh, discharge of the battery between, you know, late June or early July and the end of August uh, when the summer demand uh, months pick up. Uh, and then finally, the last kind of operational behavior we tend to see is, um, you know, multi-day uh, discharging or, or charging of the battery to kind of stopgap the system during uh, low renewable energy events. So this is the, the kind of behavior that we tend to see 
And it's one of the outcomes of, of this modeling. And it helps us think about, again, where is our system creating value? And then also, what do we need to go test? You know, how do we need to go design the system to operate? Uh, or essentially, how do we need to test the system? Uh, how do we expect it to operate? What kind of um, tests should we run against the batteries and all of these kinds of things? Um, and then the last slide that I have is really just comparing um, you know, how a, a multi-day storage system uh, this is from a snapshot from some work we're doing in California. Um, how a multi-day storage system would operate compared to, for example, hydrogen, which is providing more seasonal storage, and lithium-ion, which is providing that intraday cycling. Um, and again, this you know this this kind of analysis and this kind of uh, representation can just help us understand how this asset is unique relative to other types of of resources. Uh, with lithium-ion, the the kind of light purple here. Um, we see a lot of, uh, you know, basically charging and discharging every single day, you know, in particular during the months, you know, uh, you know, the kind of spring and uh, into fall months, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially solid purple, which means the batteries every single day, charging and discharging, charging and discharging. Uh, with multi-day storage, we see that, you know, which is represented by the orange, we see that complementary intraday and multi-day and monthly cycling. Um, and then with something like hydrogen, uh, we see much more of kind of a seasonal uh, seasonal story where it's really um, charging all the way from you know late winter all the way through um, the fall and then kind of discharging throughout the the winter uh, you know early winter into um, I guess still early winter uh, <laughs> but I, I think what the, the the other kind of key takeaway here is how these resources can be very complementary in the system. Um, and you know this kind of modeling can help us understand how we expect these assets to perform and and how we expect um, how we expect them to you know support other resources in providing kind of a, a clean firm portfolio. And I think that is the last slide. Um, I don't know, Annie, if you wanted to say anything here. Oh yes, just a shameless we're plug <laughs> that that we're hiring. Um, maybe just just p putting a little bit of color on that. Uh, when I joined Form last year, we were about 60 folks. Now we're about 170. Uh, and we're hiring all across the gamut, um, both on kind of the software engineering side, on, on the analytics side, on, so on Scott's team, as well as on the kind of product development um, engineering side, all across the gamut. So definitely encourage folks who are close to graduating time, uh, definitely check out uh, our careers page. Um, I will say just kind of personally, I think Form is at a very unique space where we're really thinking ahead about how we really build a new class of assets that can enable this fully decarbonized grid in a way that's really near term, right? I think a lot of people think about this in a 2050 time, a really far away time frame, but what we're showing with our technology is that it's really possible in the near term. Uh, so yeah, feel free to, to ask us any questions about Form, technology, analytics. Um, yeah, we'll take it from there. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, my question it might be a bit silly, but I was wondering what product management or product design looks in the context of um, these kind of businesses. Uh, you, you mean what, what do the teams do or what does the actual product look like? Um, what, what, maybe both, like what do, what do the teams do and, and why are the teams important for the kinds of products that, they are, uh, that you guys are working on? Yeah, um, so... That's a, it's a really good question. It's kind of you know, what what are the teams doing in a way that's kind of unique to product development in a utility space? Um, many. Uh, I think maybe I'll just speak a little bit to the product management side of things, and then can speak a little bit towards the, the other uh, engineering teams. Um, on the product management side, we think a lot about you know what exactly is it that utilities really require in terms of the requirements of a of a storage system, and I think in product management in particular, it's all about trade offs, right? What's the right cost efficiency trade-off? What's a degradation cost trade-off? Um, so the things that we think about in our team are given the landscape that uh, kind of Scott and his team put together with what utilities really need. Um, how do we actually make sure that we're helping the technology team make those right trade-offs, right? And how do we make sure that we're asking the right question in a way that can prioritize their efforts? Um, so that's what my team does. Um, in terms of the other engineering teams, I think what's you, um, what's it's kind of similar to what you'd expect in another battery company, right? You'll have kind of product development, R&D, cell development. A lot of that's kind of making sure that the actual chemistry of our system works really well. So we've got a lot of folks on the cell development side. Um, on the product and systems development, it's how do we really build this in a way that's very reliable uh, across all types of kind of weather or extreme weather events um, that you have to manage towards in the utility timeframe. Um, 
And then there's also kind of the manufacturing level that that as well, which is how do I not only build something to blast in the field, but how do I also build it in a way that um, can be manufactured easily and can be manufactured reliably, reliably. So we got a lot of folks on the engineering and systems development. So those are the folks who are based out in uh, West Berkeley and the, the cell R&D and development teams are based in Somerville. I'd also add that, you know, in, in the utility space, um, it's, you know, very, it's, and I think this is generally true of, of hardware broadly, but I think it's particularly true of, uh, you know, utility scale bulk power applications where the things that you're building, you know, the unit sizes are very big. Uh, they are kind of costly just from an aggregate dollar perspectives uh, perspective. Um, you know, we, it's very different than software. You can't afford to kind of release a product and do A-B testing and, uh, you know, see, uh, you know, judge consumer reaction. You really have to kind of predict where you expect, uh, you know, what you expect demand to look like three to five years out, or maybe in, in certain cases, like a decade out um, and say, you know, th that's the product that we're going to go build. And, you know, that, that kind of, um, you know, that kind of decision-making where you're saying, you know, knowing what we know today or, you know, what is the kind of best risk of, uh, informed uh, decision that we can make about what to go build um, that we think will meet customer needs, knowing that, you know, we're locking in decisions today about product design that are going to last, you know, three to five years on, on a development cycle. Um, so I think that is something that is kind of uniquely true of um, hardware and, and, and in particular, hardware in the kind of utility scale uh, energy space. What's the biggest product or market assumption that Forum Energy still needs to validate? You want to talk, start, Scott? Um, if I understood the question correctly, is what is the biggest assumption that a market or product assumption that we think about? Is that? That you guys still need to validate or MLS on something like that. Still needs validation. Uh, yeah. So, um, I mean, th there's a lot, quite frankly. I mean, the, the, I think there's two related things. I mean, at, one of the biggest things that drives value for our system, you know, we, we hope to be the least cost form of uh, clean firm capacity. We want to provide kind of reliable capacity to utilities. Uh, in a zero carbon fashion, and we want to be the cheapest resource to do that. Um, that kind of assumes that utilities want clean firm capacity, uh, <laughs> clean clean being a, a differentiator uh, than just firm capacity. Um, so, you know, I, I think that is validated by both the kind of investment decisions that utilities are making, and obviously the broader you know focus on decarbonization in the United States. Um, but you know, we we are kind of skating to where we think the puck will be. Uh, you know, we think that that trend is going to continue um, and that the nature of what, you know, firm capacity or clean firm capacity looks like is going to continue to require, you know, longer and longer duration assets. Um, and I think that the kind of related piece there is we are assuming uh, to, a, to a degree that utilities are not going to want to, uh, or maybe policymakers and, and really customers are not going to want to continue to rely on natural gas uh, to provide that firm capacity resource. Um, that we're going to, you know, start to demand um, clean alternatives to providing firm capacity. Uh, so I, I think that is a, a big assumption um, that, you know, we continue to advocate for, showing that there are alternatives to natural gas to provide firm capacity, um, and that those alternatives are, are better in many ways. Um, but that is kind of an assumption that uh, ultimately drives, you know, how we think about where the, the right market opportunities are for us. Yeah, I, I guess I'll add on to, to Scott's point, which is, um, you know, it's an assumption that utilities will choose to not build new gas assets, but it's also like they, a lot of the excuse that they may use is that there aren't good affordable options today. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg, you know, if we had a solution like ours that lasts for 100 hours, that is cost effective and affordable, then could you re retire gas plants, right? So it's it, that that is the premise that we are going out with, but still something that we actively engage with uh, customers all the time, right? And that's that's where the value of kind of this modeling piece comes in is showing you how you actually deliver on that reliable piece uh, without other gas assets. Right, and the main way you validate it is the assumption that there's assumption that there's not going to be 
Yeah, it's, it's a great question about like, how do you validate your assumptions? So um, it's actually unique to form where we have a very close relationship with a lot of these utilities. Um, Cause when we take the perspective of, we wanna help you build towards your goals, right? Depending on what's unique to your grid, what's out there, um, how do we actually make you enable that future and how can we do that cost effectively? So by kind of taking those data sets and kind of working very closely hand in hand with them, you know, here's your, here's your grid, here's how we see it. This is where multi-day storage could provide value in that system. Then that, then through that close interaction, we're kind of validating that particular assumption. Yeah. Uh, super cool to see uh, what forms up to you. Thanks guys. Uh, just one question. Um, it seems like a uh, big part of the value of Forms Battery is uh, sort of its capacity value for mm -hmm. meeting uh, peak events. And uh, capacity markets are uh, sort of can be very flawed uh, throughout the US. I'm curious how much you guys think uh, current electricity markets need to change in order to fairly uh, incentivize uh, products like Forms. Or you know, do you think that their, their current form is sufficient uh, for you guys? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I would say that, you know, I, I think we pretty strongly believe um, that uh, markets will need to change pretty dramatically to encourage decarbonization. Uh, markets are, uh, this, this is a really complex topic, of course, uh, but by and large, markets are very good at kind of coordinating or our current our current electricity markets in the US are very good at coordinating existing assets to ensure the system operates reliably and cost effectively given the, the resource mix that exists today. Um, they are, uh, they have not proven to be particularly effective at driving uh, the kinds of investments we need to maintain system, you know, e even, you know, putting aside the decarbonization objectives. They have not proven to be particularly effective at, at driving um, investment decisions in a way that is kind of least cost and, and um, effective in that sense. And that's that's been uh, demonstrated, you know, again, putting aside decarbonization goals, that's been demonstrated for, for existing technology. So by and large, you know, our, our markets are shown, have been shown to, to kind of operate really well, but not necessarily kind of ensure that the, that, um, we have the right resource mix moving forward. Uh, and then once you start to layer on the complexities of, uh, of decarbonization and, and what that means, and in particular, the need to drive kind of innovation. And so you're not just thinking about static efficiency, but you're thinking about dynamic efficiency, meaning you know, the efficiency of the, of the power system over time. Um, our markets are, are really not great at, at optimizing for that alone. Um, so I, you know, one really simple example that I, give often, and, and you kind of touched on with respect to capacity markets, you know, capacity markets are designed, assuming that the kind of reserve product, meaning the thing that will get built um, at the end of the day is a natural gas combustion turbine. And that kind of sets the maximum clearing price in, in technical terms, it's called like the cost of new entry, um, is always based on a natural gas combustion turbine burning natural gas. Uh, that is not a zero carbon solution. So if you're kind of benchmarking your, the reserve price in your market against a carbon emitting solution, that's obviously going to skew the types of resources uh, that you tend to see in the market. Um, so that's just one you know, really simple example, but uh, we could really go on all day. I mean, I think our, our markets are designed really about meeting short-term peaks and are not really uh, kind of starting to think about multi-day uh, renewable energy lulls and you know energy sufficiency over over these multi-day periods and uh, all different kinds of things. So um, I would say our markets are both a marvel of kind of engineering and economics. They're they're really incredible and they they ensure that the system, uh, which is the you know the largest machine ever built, uh, operates effectively. Uh, but they have their limits and will will need to evolve as we push towards decarbonization. Go ahead, Follow up to that question, and that is in your work, either one of you or both, uh, do you think the way forward in this regard is educating the regulators, because we've heard a lot from the regulators here, or kind of complementary, uh, I don't even know who these are, but I expect they are complementary entrepreneurs that are doing other things that would, in a sense, 
work around the status quo ante. I wouldn't even blame that on regulators. It could be other public acceptance, blah, blah, blah. Do you spend a lot of time on that? The other model could be we leave that up to our innovative utilities to handle all that stuff. So how do you do, how do, you do all that? Uh, we are engaging directly with, you know, regulators and, and um, market operators. So that, you know, again, we're, we're playing a multi-decade game. We want to be building the markets for the long haul. Uh, so we are working with those folks. Um, I would also say we're working directly with entities that maybe want to move faster than, uh, you know, the market more broadly. So either, you know, there are very progressive forward thinking uh, vertically integrated utilities. Um, vertically integrated utilities get are, are uh, maligned frequently for maybe being conservative or, or uh, slow moving or something like that. But there are many that are looking to the future and saying, you know, we see the writing on the wall. We see the need to decarbonize. We want to get out of ahead of this issue and start. Uh, you know, we recognize we've done the modeling. We recognize the kind of resource gaps and that we're going to need something else. And so we want to start. You know, buying in today on solutions that we think uh, can support us in decarbonization. So there are those kind of entities, and then you know, there's also the you know municipalities and commercial and industrial customers that also want to move faster than the broader um, the broader grid. And so they're saying, okay, we we're going to try and push this issue forward. Um, so th there, are, I think there's the customers that'll kind of move uh, quickly, and and we we work really closely with those customers, and then. You know, I, I do think there's room for entrepreneurs that can, uh, you know, create new ways of operating markets or, you know, new financial incentives and uh, things like that, that can um, allow customers to understand the, the carbon emissions impacts of their decisions. So, you know, where, depending on where you are in the grid and, and how you're operating, um, you know, what the emissions impacts are and things like that. So I think there's, there's definitely room for regulators, uh, customers, and, and entrepreneurs across the board. Yeah, very exciting. And Sarah conveniently uh, uh, arranged the talk. We had a, the biggest CCA in California speak last week. Mm -hmm. So I could see uh, those right. other people you mm -hmm. could reach out to because they are mm -hmm. similarly minded, it seems to me. So that's pretty terrific. With that said, I'd like to, uh, before I thank these guys, uh, thank uh, Sarah and Marlies for a terrific quarter and all of you for uh, being here. Uh, We'll look forward to reading your final essays. If you have any questions or comments, I know I owe a couple of people feedback on some of their interests, but feel free to do so. Uh, so with that said, we'll move on to the up close and personal student session uh, with Annie and thank uh, very much for uh, actually doing a great job of uh, not only uh, creating a crescendo at the end of the quarter, but tying a lot of uh, themes that we've had uh, exposed here together in a very creative and entrepreneurial way. So thank you, Annie, and thank you, Scott, for a great, great talk. Thank you. Thank you.